Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what my model is currently showing for the presidential election, uh, which is actually what we're looking, up, uh, looking at on screen right now. Talking a little bit about uh, each candidate's path to 270, uh, which is the magic number needed to win the Electoral College. And lastly, of course, the uh, what I'm going to be doing the other two videos of the week. Um, also, just as kind of a heads up, I've decided that I'm going to be streaming history-related stuff on Saturday nights, typically around 9 or 10, depends on whenever I feel like actually going live. Um, if you do like the content on this channel, of course, likes, comments, subscriptions, they, they do help and they are appreciated. Um, and yeah. See if we can get to 500 before um, Independence Day. That'd be pretty cool. Don't think it's going to happen, but that'd be pretty cool. Um, so, yeah. The, my model, of course, I think what it... I, I think the reason why it will swing like this if polls look really good for one candidate or really bad for another is, for some reason, I think the model acts in a way where a preponderance of data will reinforce a certain outcome. So when we had two or three weeks of really good Trump polling back in February, uh, it looked like Trump was actually going to blow out Joe Biden in the Electoral College, maybe even make us run for Virginia and Nevada. Whereas now that his numbers are, they've taken basically a nosedive, um, it seems that uh, it's not good. Let me just do a quick little double check, make sure that Ohio, no, whoops, I got Ohio off. And that means Iowa might be off too. Yeah. There we go. Like Nebraska, yeah, I'd still say, there we go. I mean, still, these, these aren't exactly the figures that uh, you want to, th this isn't exactly the map you want to be looking at if you're Donald Trump. Um, it's slightly better than not having Iowa and Ohio, but it's also not great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what is Donald Trump's path to 270? Well, he has to win Georgia. He has to win Florida. He really probably needs to win North Carolina. Second district in Nebraska and the second district in Maine are also effectively must-wins. The next state that might flip to him... And by the way, he's still one electoral vote shy if he were to win Pennsylvania, so that'd be a potential tie. But I feel that Arizona would, is still going to be the next state that would flip for him, and then you would need any of these. And Wisconsin, in my opinion, is the most likely for the Donald to win. Um, and that would put him over the top. Um and by the way, I actually believe that this would be a 5% national loss, uh, national popular vote loss for Donald Trump. Like, he really could win the Electoral College while losing the popular vote by 5%. And it might not even be this narrow. He could maybe even make the argument that he could pick up Pennsylvania. And that's a lot to lose by and still be able to win the Electoral College. Obviously, Biden really just needs to, you know, pick up these three Rust Belt states that Clinton lost in 16 and he wins the Electoral College. But obviously, he wants to be playing as wide a map as possible, and thus the map we see here. And I suspect Biden is going to focus his efforts on the Southeast Corridor, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and the Southwest and try and pick up Arizona. Because for some reason, that seems like a very... 
that seems like what the Democrats are going to want to try to do because they're going to see all these good polls out from that area. They're going to see good polls out from the Rust Belt as well. At least currently they are. But something tells me that they're not going to focus there because, well, why should they when they've got those on lockdown and they're close to winning North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Arizona? So let's focus on those states. And they could very well lose those. And then, yeah, say they pick up their... Would that be enough to flip it? Yeah, it would. And that's the thing. That is the scary thing for Democrats is Donald Trump doesn't actually need Florida. He's he's going to get it if he's winning the presidential, if he's winning, but he doesn't need it from a technical standpoint um, or from a mathematics standpoint. Um, but yeah, so the path to do 70 for each candidate is actually fairly straightforward. And that's the path to the minimum 270. That's not necessarily to greater than 270. Um, Biden certainly has an advantage. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, but I think it's I think it's still too early to be making calls um, stating that, oh, this is Biden's race to lose or Biden's got this in the bag already. Um, November is still a long way away. We've still got five months of heavy campaigning to conventions. Three presidential debates, one vice presidential debate, which actually might not be... Well, actually, it will be important because Biden's VP is basically an insurance policy. Um, in case he dies of natural causes because of his age. I mean, same thing with Donald Trump. So that actually might matter more than it would in normal years because of the extreme age of both candidates. Um, their vice presidential picks are going to be very important, and Donald Trump's gonna, sticking with Pence. So, But, yeah. Yeah. We've still got a lot of time left. A lot of major news stories have yet to be written, broken, or even thought about. And this has been one of the crazier years on record. I still don't think this is, you know, 1968 level yet, but it's, it's getting pretty close. Um, it is getting close. So, on Wednesday, I'm going to be doing a hypothetical of what could be the takeaways from a Biden victory. So, I'm going to be hypoth calling that one how or why Joe Biden won. So it's going to be looking at it as if I'm recording on November the 4th, or basically the day after election day, and covering the reasons why, why a Joe Biden victory happened. And on Friday, I'm gonna do the same for Donald Trump because I think it's important to learn the lessons of an election rather than just cover the election results itself. For example, what was the lesson, lesson of 2016? Well, you can't choose a candidate whose whole ideology is opportunism, and you can't choose a candidate who is too establishment. Hillary Clinton was the definition of the establishment, and her whole ideology was opportunism. If a policy would make her popular and make her poll numbers rise, she would be in, in favor of it. So that led to her being for a massive border fence across the entire U.S.-Mexican border. And then she was against it. And she was for deportations and strict immigration controls. And then she was getting close to supporting amnesty. She was against gay marriage and then she was for it. Um, 
And you can go on and on and on about policies or politicians she supported and then didn't, or didn't support and then did. Um, free trade deals, for example. She was in favor of TPP, and then she came out against it when it started becoming unpopular. She was for NAFTA, and then she was against it when it started becoming unpopular to be for it. Um, back in the 60s, Hillary Clinton was a Goldwater girl. As in, supporting Barry Goldwater. Now, don't get me wrong, I... I actually kind of like cold water, but not necessarily for the reasons that I think a lot of people will claim that cold water held, which, as far as I can tell, he didn't. But, unfortunately, uh, voting against the Civil Rights Act uh, is, is going to make you an automatic racist. So, yeah. And I think he was actually wrong for voting against it simply because at the end of the day the Civil Rights Act was an example of good government because it was government that was being used to take out bad government. So, there's that. Um, whereas you needed a little element of populism. You needed a little element of something a little off-brand or that hadn't been talked about. And you absolutely had to be able to use social media to your advantage. And you had to get as much coverage as possible. This is why Bernie Sanders did so well in the primary, even though it wasn't that great if we look at it. And a healthy portion of his supporters in 2016 were just anti-Clinton. Um, not necessarily pro-Bernie, and that's evidenced by how he did in the 2016 primaries, where he never gained on his performance from 2016 in any state, except maybe his own, except maybe Vermont. But Vermont's his home state, so... Eh. And the problem is, Joe Biden isn't really anti-establishment either. He is appallingly bad at social media. Like... Let me put it this way. His tweets are the way I would respond... I'm not particularly good at social media. So when he criticizes uh, something Trump does, it's this long, drawn-out thing where Trump just tweets all caps to make America great again. What's going to get more likes and retweets? A point-by-point -point critique that has, you know, that takes a lot of effort to think about and that you have to verify, yes, are these facts or not, or hashtag make America great again. It's going to be the hashtag make America great again because that's a very simple message. It's a very on point message for Donald Trump. And it's a brand that is easily identifiable. Um, and basically, it's a meme. And you may be saying, oh God, you're going into this whole meme warfare theory. Um, yes and no. The idea of a meme is simply just an idea or an image or a short little clip that is easily spread around, an idea basically, that spreads like wildfire through distribution and can even evolve, right? And all good advertising, in many ways, is a meme. Think about all the jingles that you know by heart. You know, for example, that old McDonald's one that when I think it was like ba da ba ba ba, you know, that sort of thing. They're easily identifiable. They're you know exactly what they are the second somebody you know says one, one of these jingles or slogans or anything like that, and it's already in your head. I mean, 
seriously. It's and, and political advertising needs. I think Donald Trump was the first person that realized that political advertising needed to be like this in order to truly take hold in people's minds. And I don't think the Democratic Party is kept up. The other problem that Joe Biden has is, while Donald Trump would arguably, from a traditional standpoint, make gaffes, his supporters don't seem to count them as gaffes. And a lot of moderates are just like, well, that's just how he speaks. A lot of people who are swing voters are just like, yeah, that's just how he talks. That's not really a gaffe. Joe Biden, on the other hand, even his supporters understand that he makes gaffes left, right, and center. I mean, seriously. He talked about liking it when kids jumped up and down on his lap or played with the hair on his legs. And then, of course, you know, the... Poor kids can be just as smart as white kids. Really, Biden? Really? There's no way you can have a positive spin on that. And the problem is Joe Biden's supporters are the type of people who would hate him for saying something like that. Whereas when Donald Trump makes a gaffe, his supporters are just like, eh, whatever, who cares, next thing. And independents and swing voters are just like, eh, I mean, that's probably not the right thing to say, but it's Donald Trump, what do you expect? And I think that's where the big difference is. I'm not sure what the takeaway from that is just yet. Whether or not all free media coverage, good or bad, is good for polling numbers or good for electoral results, I don't know. We probably never will know, at least not for 20, 30, 40 years. Or do you actually need to retain some politician-like demeanor, some sane person demeanor? Um, I know Democrats are going to hate me for this, but I think the best candidate they could have actually selected for their nominee this year was either Klobuchar or Buttigieg. Buttigieg, because he was center-left, at least by, you know, Democratic, you know, Democratic Party standards. Uh, same, similar situation with Klobuchar. But he was young. He wasn't part of the establishment. Uh, Klobuchar establishment to an extent, but she's got that whole Minnesota nice thing, so people aren't going to care too much about that. Um, both candidates were from the Midwest um, in the Rust Belt, so the reality is that both candidates actually have a lot of similarities that in the end would be able to allow them to kind of fight what Trump has on his, you know, in his turf and actually do so potentially effectively. Biden, I think, was one of the worst candidates. I think Bernie was the absolute worst, but Biden certainly gives him a run for his money. Um, because Biden has problems that are basically Hillary Clinton-esque in nature, except he's a lot more likable than Hillary Clinton. Um, Bernie is anti-establishment, but he has a lot of, well, baggage because he himself claims to be a socialist. Uh... And just sticking the word democratic in front of something, number one, does not make it so, and number two, doesn't necessarily make it good. I mean, look at the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. But, and I'm not implying that Sanders is Kim Jong-un light or something like that. No, he, he isn't. He's not that crazy. 
but Bernie's problem is that he's just too far to the left. You're not going to convince your soccer mom in Loudoun County to get rid of her private health insurance that serves her extremely well, nor are you going to convince her that paying massive taxes to give someone else insurance when she's not going to see the benefits is going to be a good idea. You're also not going to convince her to go for private, er, not private, sorry, uh, for publicly subsidized college tuition for her kids whom she's contributing to a college fund because she's a soccer mom in Loudoun County and she can afford to do that. You know, you're not going to convince these upper middle class suburban voters that we need to completely revamp the system in order to help them when their lives are doing quite well. When they are doing quite well in this world. So why should they implement some sort of dramatic radical change that is only going to weaken them from a financial standpoint? And good luck convincing ex-urban and rural America to, to vote for someone who has extremely progressive social ideas and wants them to get rid of their truck, move to a city, and get a hybrid. When this family doesn't really have the skills to cut it in a city because they don't have a college degree. Even though you take a city slicker and toss them out into the sticks out here, they're not going to survive simply because, what the hell? You want me to do manual labor? What? No! Or, you know, even further out, wait, you mean I have to bake my own bread? Wait, you mean I have to make my own, you know, food? I have to catch my own food? Yeah, no, screw this. I'm, you know. <laughs> so, I think what the problem is, is there's becoming a large cultural divide in America, and it's less and less becoming between ne not, ne not really social liberals and social conservatives. There is some difference. But it's starting to be divided rural and urban. And I talked a lot about this in 2016. I think I talked about it in 2017, 2018, 2019. I'm talking about it again. The rural-urban divide is a real thing here in the United States. And the problem is each group is becoming less and less able to accept that the other is just different and sometimes needs different rules applied to it. You know, there are towns in America where you actually could live on $9 an hour. And there are places where $15 an hour just isn't enough. So, what we really need to do is, you know, preserve, fed, you know, federalism, basically, a divide between states and federal and county governments. But, you know, this is getting into me talking about opinion rather than just obs observations about what's going on in Amer America. So, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. I uh, thank everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Again, likes, comments, subscriptions, they always do help. And I'm greatly appreciative of any and all I receive. Uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.